Good evening. How are we all? Welcome along. It is another inspirational conversation. Uh, today we are talking to a gentleman that I first spoke to about 23 years ago. He was ready to release his debut album. Uh, since then, I've influenced him and inspired him so much that he's actually moved to Birmingham and he considers himself, uh, you know, a, a fellow Brummy now. Uh, there is no other way to introduce the legend that is Wookie to the stream. And I'll say good afternoon. How are you, man? Good afternoon. Right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It is evening yeah. indeed. Uh, I like to just get straight into this at the very beginning because we want people to know what's going down. We yeah. are going to be having a conversation for however long it takes, finding out about your illustrious career. We're going to be finding out uh, a little bit more about your character and we're going to be finding out about some of the highs and lows that you've achieved in this game. Uh, I want to begin by saying that despite my tone with you, it will be very jovial. I am one of your biggest fans. I hold you in complete high regard. Uh, so, uh, I'm a very cool man. I'm a and, a, and a very good friend. <laughs> But I want yeah, to put that you. aside. Uh, you know, we I are we're going to have a great conversation. Um, but if ever and now and again I do give you a little bit of ribbing, it's only because <laughs> I, I, it's because I love you so much. So we start <laughs> off by just checking all of my screen. I make sure that everything is working fine. I sound okay. You look and sound great. Amy is saying good evening. As is J Soul. Uh, so I can see that the chats are working fine. Good evening, people. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, if you are joining us, then please do feel free to leave a shout in the chat. And as well, for everyone coming back and checking out the recording, please do leave some comments uh, because all the interaction does uh, help the channel a great deal. So, Wookie, the Wook star, Mr. Chu, uh, how do you actually prefer to be addressed? Or does it depend who you're talking to? Depends who I'm talking to most of the time. It's Jason. <laughs> Jay. Jay? Jason? Does Jay yeah. offend you or is Jay okay? Whatever people want. Yeah. JJ, Jay, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so good evening, Serge. Good evening, Mrs. Ward. Good evening, Lisa. Thank you all for passing through. Um, I will be keeping my eye on the chat and every now and again, I might pause our conversation and uh, mm. draw reference to the man's dem. Okay, so... A lot of the questions I'm going to be asking you today, I already know the answers to, but hopefully I'm going to be getting um, a little bit of insight, uh, you know, take you down some avenues that may surprise me. So we need to begin, I guess, by uh, finding out exactly when you were born and what life was like growing up in your, let's say, the first 10 years of life for yourself. Oh, OK. Um, I was born in Stoke Newington, London, uh, which is kind of... It's, to me, it's North East London, but there isn't a North East London, so it's kind of considered East. Okay. But I've uh, only into London uh, first 10 years of my life. Um, early 70s, right? Early 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm born in 1972. Mm -hmm. 27th of July, 1972. Same numbers the other way around. 27, 7, 72. I love saying that, <laughs> but it's something special in that. <laughs> <laughs> okay and the um siblings how how do you fall in the line of siblings i'm the oldest of uh, my parents my mother's three children and uh, it's me first then my sister and then it was my brother mm -hmm. my brother passed away a couple of years ago mm -hmm. well we will get to we will get to talk about that a little later on so north london uh, in the early 70s, I draw reference to it a lot when I'm talking to people because uh, I always have the memories of the film uh, Babylon, and yeah. I'm sure I'm sure you will relate to that as well. well. Sound Love system, sound system time, sound system culture, the uh, the influx, multiracial Britain, as it were, all that relates to you. Yeah, well, you know what, I had a slight connection to that film. First of all, because I loved it watching it, but I went to school with. Um, the little boy that was in it. You know, the bad kid? Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the main actor's name, Brindley Ford, his brother. I went to school with him, a smart Monero. He's about five years older than me, though. But that was my little claim to fame back I then. I was just about to say that would I be a claim to fame, right? Smart Monero, man. 
Big up Mark Manero. He's still on my Facebook somewhere. <laughs> one of what well, this is your story, not mine, but I'll say yeah. very, very very quickly. One of my claim to fame when I was eleven, uh this yeah, actually was I eleven? I can't even remember now. No, I must have been older, fifteen. Uh this young girl I was seeing who lived around Aston, she went to school with one of the kids from uh Musical Youth. And uh, oh, really? <laughs> and, 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 and uh she got him to call me up from the phone box one evening <laughs> and I dined out on that for years. <laughs> so, you know, when you're young, those kind of things, they make a big deal, right? Well, there's a quite a few. Like, um, I went to, uh, DJ Spoonie went to my school. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mark Minera, as I said, he was an actor. Uh, Ricky from EastEnders, Sid Owen was in my class. Okay. Also, Max from EastEnders was in my class as well. We're all the same age. Me, Max, and Sid Owen in the same year. But wow. I would have said Max. I would have said Max was older. That ginger hair. Yeah, hasn't you would done, say that. Hasn't yeah. done him any favors, has it? I forgot Jake Wood. His name is Jake Wood. Mm -hmm. Jake. Jake. Jake was in my class. He was like he was one of them cool dudes. Mm -hmm. It was very cool. My mate Wayne really had a had a, a bit of a liking to him. He always thought Jake was really cool. Mm -hmm. And well, I'm sure, I'm sure. I'm sure there were many people who thought you were cool as well. Let me uh, say, no in school, man. No in school. I'm a late developer. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna prod you a little more about that. But I want to say hi to Pogwash. Good evening, my friend. Also hey, to Pog. Emily, who's saying what a smile, looking at you, kinning teeth. <laughs> and uh, Pat Bedo, representing Bedfunk TV, says what's up, Wooks. So, so good evening. Okay, so let's let's get back to the original question. Um, life in the music was a big part of of your growing up as well. You came from a mm -hmm. musical family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my dad. Um, he originally was a chef, but he packed that all in when he got kind of more introduced to the uh, the record making business in the reggae industry in the seventies. He's a uh, part of um, a sound system, or well, quite a few sound systems in the seventies. A couple in East London and one or two in North London. And um, yeah, I kind of got into the studio side by going with him to the studio to record artists and stuff like that. Okay. And then the pressing plants, you know, seeing records getting pressed. This is so, all that. So let me take me back then, because I might have just missed that while I'm watching to make sure everything's working fine. So he was a chef. Yeah. How did, how did he make the transition then into music? I think it was through his love of music and the people he knew were how he got introduced into the actual making music, you know, going from just being someone loved in music to actually putting musicians together and the singer and, you know, what our producer was like mm -hmm. back in the day, you know, couldn't play anything or sing or whatever, but you put the musicians with the singer to create a song and then, you, you know, you produce the whole thing. That's what a producer is. Okay, so the studio that that began at, tell us about that. Um, that would have been various different studios that he would hire. There were friends of his, um, uh, a production duo by the name of Matthew and Fluxy. Um, they were quite influential with, well, in terms of, they were like the British Sly and Robbie. Okay. So, you know, watching them work and then actually working with them years later, when eventually um i was at soul to soul we get to that but they were involved in that as well so i knew them for at least 10 15 years before working with him with at soul to soul uh -huh. so they were a big influence in the, the uh creation of music watching okay. their work okay so i've been in the studio with, with your dad and, and going out and about on the streets did you ever bring trouble to the front door no never i was a good kid uh, it was a good kid. I, I, I had the fear of the mum in me. Uh -huh. You know, like some people like, I had a mate of mine who would sneak out from his house at night. Never would I do that. Never, ever, 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 ever. There's no way. My mum literally would kill me. Uh, did she have, she had a good throw with the wooden yeah, club? She, my mum had a good grip <laughs> on me. You know what I mean? Which, you know what? I praise her for that now because I've never been in trouble with the police. Never, never. There was never an issue come to my mum's door regarding me or my brother. Uh -huh. Good, good, good. We like to hear it. We like to hear it. Um, what would you say was uh, a major, a major part then as, as you come in of age, 10, 11, 12, 13, the music's changing from the 80s sound into the, 
you know, electro, hip hop uh, and whatever. W- were you moving along the same as us all or were you more on the, the reggae soul side of things? Well, at home, I would say I was on the reggae side up until probably 13, 14. Obviously, I watched Top of the Pops like everyone else, you know, every week to, you know, see the, the countdown and all that. So I had that and the radio, but at home, it was reggae. And my dad was a bit of a soul boy as well in terms of, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of some old names that he would like, but he's a soul, soul boy reggae man, if you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, um, like Teddy Pendergrass or yeah, Luther yeah, Vendras? like some of them classics. Oh, yeah. Luther's more in the a bit too pacey, you know. He's like classic soul. Okay, he still buys like sixty pound seven inch <laughs> records of some old soul tune. I'm like sixty pound for this, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, collecting records is a you know. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. I, I never got into that. It's uh, it's a it's a great thing, and it can can be a curse as well for some people. Well, you see all the records behind you. Uh huh. Behind me. Contrary to what people believe, they think, "Oh, you must have so many records." I don't have one vinyl in this house. In fact, I think I do, and it was a test press that someone sent me <laughs> about three weeks. <laughs> about three months ago. And that's Wonderful. it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, so um, going out in the back then was was the what was. What was your social life? Was it uh, youth centres, school discos? Yeah, blues? yeah, yeah. Not really the blue. See, like I said, I was a good kid, so I didn't really start. And earlier I said I'm a late developer. So I didn't actually go to my first blues until I was about, I think about, say, like it's um, young, 17. But you know, some people are doing it at like 13, 14 and all that. I went with my cousin. And my cousin's, um, my cousin and his, well, his dad was a little bit, they had a bigger family, so there's a little bit looser and they, you know, go out with him somewhere to uh, the local, uh, an estate nearby him that you would never want to go to by yourself. <laughs> but there was a party in there. I remember coming home at like six in the morning and that was the first time I ever done that. But um, yeah, I didn't, uh, I went to, a cu- you know, a couple of uh, youth club parties, you know, um, sixth form. But my, my my musical taste changed around there. That's when you would say that's what eighty eight, eighty nine. That's when um, everything starts to fuse, really, because mm-hmm. you've got you know um, reggae that I had. But then I'm getting influ- I'm being influenced by some of my school friends and what they're listening to. I mean, I actually remember uh, talking to a friend of mine, uh, a friend of mine called Nick Smooth, and um, Nick Smooth. <laughs> And um, I asked him what he was into, and he told me, told me two names, Basic Black and Guy, right? And then I remember getting into that, and then that was me. I'm a New Jack Swing man now. But at the same time, I'm New Jack Swing. I'm still reggae, uh-huh. still reggae, but I'm also... Full, full kick suit? Uh, no, 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 no. Not, not... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do the click suit thing. Definitely done the hairstyles, the little Gumby stuff, and the, the little bandana around the neck and all that. And the pin rolls, yeah, nice. but not the kick suit. I didn't go in with the kick suit. <laughs> the baggy trousers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking M- MC Hammer kind of thing. Oh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Pogwash, I, I know Pogwash will relate like that. to that 100%. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know so Pogwash from back there. <laughs> 88, 89, of course, the, the landscape of the UK is changing. It's a story yeah. that we're all really familiar with. Um, so tell us um, how then, when the interest for actually making music yourself began or was it just being around the music naturally? Well, the funny thing, when I was around the music with my dad, I didn't necessarily want to get into it. If you know what I mean, it was just there. And I used to play about on my dad, a little keyboard. He couldn't play for shit, but he had a little keyboard, a little mixing desk and, you know, and uh, I used to play about that on that, but it didn't actually start until leaving school. Well, near the later years of my school, um, some school friends, they were in a band and uh, I didn't know they were in a band. I'm like wondering where everyone is because it's time to go home and they're in the music room rehearsing. So, you know, I'm knocking on the door and basically I blagged my way into the band, but I couldn't play anything. I remember another friend of mine, Errol, a school friend, he um, showed me how to play the chords. He goes, okay, play these chords. Then he got three, three. Uh, three finger chords and I go I can't play that 
So he goes, all right, then do these two. Do, do. I'm basically playing chops. <laughs> and I still couldn't do it right. But from that, that led me to a year or two later buying my own synth when I left school, getting um, credit, HP credit, and buying this synth for like £1,100. It's my first job. And you know, like you've got security of a job, so you've got, you, you can get credit. So I got this synth. And then six months later, I got laid off. Wow. So, so now I'm at home. So, so tell us, tell us about the uh, two questions. Uh, were you, uh, did you do well at school um, results wise? And what was that first job? Um, I would say I didn't do well at school. I, uh, I do believe that, no, I believe I know we were, my year was the first year of it moving from O level to GCSE. Mm -hmm. So, I really don't remember in school tons of kids getting all A's and B's and all that, unless I really went to a, a thick school. But I don't remember, you know, you know, like you see now, oh, they got 10 A's or what? I'm like, what? What? There was like a couple of boys in my year that got B's, let alone five A's and all this stuff. So I did it, I was average in school. And, um, but I could draw. I wanted to be, I wanted to be an architect or graphic okay. designer. Yeah, that's what actually I left school wanted to do. And that was my first job. I was an apprentice at um, an architect's firm, uh, quite a large firm in Covent Garden. This was called um, RHWL. I started on a reception. I used to uh, take over from the receptionist at her lunch break and then do the general office dog, <laughs> dog's body, making teas and running to the and you know what I mean, getting supplies and stuff. And then... Um, yeah, and this was uh, 1990, and a big recession happened, so we got made redundant. The company went down from three buildings down to one, and, you know, I'm one of the last people in, so I'm first out. And um, that forced me to stay at home, and all I could do was learn this keyboard, or, you know, learn how to use it and then be creative. It just kind of naturally happened, really, because uh, I've never had any um, musical lessons. No, no training. No, no, no training or anything like that. It's just, just used to feel my way through it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's 18, 18 coming on 19. Yeah. Um, and by this point, surely your mum must have let loose of the reins a little bit. You're starting to go out a, a, a bit more. Were you driving? Were the girls on the no, scene? I didn't start driving until I was uh, 23, I think. Okay. 22, yeah. 23. But uh, those are the days where my mum was giving me side eye. <laughs> Because you, you, you're not working. Actually, I moved out, but when I moved, when I lost my job and I had to move back home, I was at home and I wasn't working. So, you know, like you wake up in the morning and, well, actually, my mum didn't see me. And yeah, she saw me in the morning because she didn't see me come home until really, really late. Mm -hmm. So it was all that kind of, where were you last night? And, you know, the rains are slightly longing off and, you know, I'm, I better find myself someone to live soon. <laughs> Uh, I'm, okay. I'm like a big man. Ah, <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, so you was going out burning the candle then? You, you yeah, that. but this is this is in my twenties. This is in my early. This is yeah, nineteen twenty. Mm -hmm. Nineteen twenty. When I, that's when it all really starts, and that's relatively late, really. So when you when you were going to those raves, can you remember who some of your favorite DJs were at the time? Were you like a a Mickey Finn or a Carl Cox man or? Oh, see now. I didn't start going to rave raves okay. until about 93. Uh -huh. so, this, so I'm 19 in 1990. So for a couple of years, I'm just going to like the West End clubs. Okay. You know, the WAG, um, it was Limelights, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the clubs of the time. You know, the black so clubs, so the gold, gold it, forgive my ignorance because I've heard this story from so many different people, but when you were going then, was it sort of like your Sharon and Tracy vibes or was it clubbing, you know, no, like house was, music? No, these, the, these club, this is the, this is the, um, the R and B soul clubs. Okay. Do you know what I mean? These are R and B. It's kind of weird because I had different groups of friends. So I have a group of friends where I do this with, then I have another group of friends, some uh, Italians and Greeks, and I do this with them on different mm -hmm. days. So it took me to different places. And then another group that I began a rave raves with, which is slightly later. And then it, that kind of, that's probably why I am who I am in, musically. 
<laughs> okay, I get that. That makes a lot of sense. I, I relate to that. I, you know, I have very. I had s- school friends, people that you you know running on the street with, people yeah. who lived up Aston, where my nan was from. Four different groups of people who gave me four different characters. Absolutely. That, that's Absolutely. why you. That's why depending on what time of the day your catch me is, what what character <laughs> you get in. <laughs> uh okay so then uh yeah we're talking about the music breakthroughs or something yeah so, happened so, we're going, this. so we're going in so after me um working at home on the keyboard and stuff this is where i then probably about 90 91 92 i meet way marshall okay and Way Marshall used to work at Music House, which is a dub cutting place, which my dad and my brother worked at. There's Chris Hanson who owns it. He's like an uncle to me. I, I actually, where Music House well, was, the famous Music House uh, place in Holloway, I remember uh, moving them in the first time, putting up the stuff on the ceiling. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so again, you're going to have to forgive my ignorance. Mm-hmm. I, I know about Music House. I have a lot of dub plates here, but mm-hmm. I'm not familiar with the actual history of the place itself. So is it was a, a press a general press implant for record labels or it was just a dub place? It's a, it was a dub cutting place. Originally oh, purely music a dub okay. music house purely a dub cutting place from the reggae industry. So okay. I know it from my dad. Now how it comes later when we start getting into where jungle starts using dub plates and stuff. So they start coming to music house and it got so busy with them that the reggae guys didn't come anymore because they had too long to wait and there was too many people there so okay. they found another place to go to so jungle kind of took over music house mm-hmm. in, so the, the dub play, in, in the back of my mind i'm thinking it is a ridiculous thing to actually explain it but we're talking about people with exclusive productions who would bring it in off of a uh, off of a DAT predominantly or a CD? Even a cassette get, back then. And a cassette, wow! Get <laughs> yeah. a one a one a one a one off piece uh, a one off of piece of vinyl acetate pressed, acetate, yeah. and then they'd go and play on that evening. Yeah. That um, was the only that, way that you could play something in a club, you know, because it's only record players, and this uh, this technology enabled you to have one copy. That's it. You know, um, very expensive copy. Yeah, so that was probably I've probably explained that to everybody that didn't need to know it, but just, and now some it, people still know. Put a bit of context, it. put a bit of yeah. context onto it. Okay, then. So yeah, you're working. You were there a lot. Oh, I mean Wayne Marshall, and he's working there. Okay, and then working. I, I used to where I had all these tunes on my keyboard because my keyboard used to store the songs in it, but then there's no way of recording it off. So I used to go to music house with my keyboard to record it on a DAT tape, right? So I've got a record of the song, you know what I mean? And then I met Wayne that way. And then he heard some of the stuff that I was recording off and liked it and wanted to write some songs to it. Now, Wayne Marshall was a reggae singer before that. He had a song called um, I-L-O-V-E which was in the early 80s I, I actually used to love that song this is before i knew him but i used to love his, his song and um he started to get into the more soulful uh r&b vibe and um so we were working together for about three years before he about two and a half years to three years before he released his album and his single g-spot well g-spot was a single that blew up for him and I did like, I think it was 12 tracks on the album and my music is about seven of them. Mm-hmm. Seven tracks of mine. And that was my- Fully, fully credited. Fully credited. Yeah, you can see, you can go find Wayne Marshall's, um, if you got the album or online, <laughs> my partner sent it to me actually. Uh, my business partner sent me a copy because his wife has got it. So he took mm-hmm. a picture of it. It says, Jason, my name back then was Cat. <laughs> K-A-C. <laughs> A A T T. <laughs> Why? Please explain. Was Red well, Dwarf out then? Red Dwarf wasn't out back then, was no, it? Uh, could, yeah, 90s. Red Dwarf. Uh, uh, so uh, nothing to do with Red Dwarf. Nothing though. to Red Dwarf. No, 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 no. It's actually sorry that I can't actually say. <laughs> okay. But it was a friend of Nick Smooth, my friend Nick Smooth, who gave me the nickname. But I'm a Leo, so I would pass off the cat part 
as Leo the Lion. That's mm-hmm. why Cat. Anyway, so um, there's some people now who know me and still call me Cat. Right. They know me from back there, call me Cat. <laughs> I'll be, yo, I left that name in the early 90s. Why do you still call me that? But uh, yeah, my name, um, on the back of Waymarks, you see Jason Cat Chu. Uh, I'm even, do you remember the days of Boys to Men, right? When, mm-hmm. um, and they used to talk. Hey baby, you know that? I'm even. I'm doing something like that on one of the tracks. <laughs> no, Barry White, London's Barry, Barry White. I'm doing some talking business on the track. I, just, I can't remember what track. What the track's called. I bet I you melted. I bet you. I bet you melted some legs. And had, had you started? Had you started blossoming? Had you started to fill your face out? Um, I think that's that's where it starts. Really, okay. we're talking about '94. 94 i'm coming into my own i'm a i'm a 22 year old again i said viral gallus well it kind of starts there (laughs) 94 95 it starts there there's a lot of memories from those years of being a young man and in my own place (laughs) Mm -hmm. but uh, yeah it all starts there Mm -hmm. okay i don't want you to make me laugh so much Uh, so Amy is uh, commenting. She says she has your music on daily, dancing around the house. She's a big fan. Oh, thank lots, you, Amy. Lots, lots of love to Amy. Um, <clears throat> all right, so let's continue with the the, the timeline. What what's the uh, what's yeah, the next so major part? Wayne Marshall. He comes out. Uh, I leave. I split up with him in terms of we don't do any more projects together. And about a year later, I meet Jazzy B. Um in the barbershop next door to where I lived. Okay. And the guy that used to do his hair, Junior Parry, he's the um, one that introduced him to me. Um, well, actually, I was in the shop, and then Junior said to Jazzy, oh, he does music or whatever. Why don't you get your tape? And I was like, what? what? You know, like when someone tells you to go and get what you, to go and show somebody what you really want them to see, but you're really mm-hmm. like, nervous. That, oh, this is, you know. I didn't want to play my tape. This is Jazzy B. I'm playing my music. I was going to say, because by this time, they've already kind of oh, they hit already their sold peak. The they've huge. already hit their peak. Yeah. And I wouldn't say they're on the downward spiral, but all their big hits were like the big back end five of the years night. Before, yeah, four or yeah, five yeah, years yeah, yeah, before yeah. that. Exactly. So um, I played him some of my stuff and um, he was like, well, you did all that. And I was like, yeah, I did all that, my keyboard. And then um, he called me in for a meeting one time. I went down there, had a conversation and then I left with a cassette with an acapella. And I think that acapella was um, uh, Rick Clark. Do you remember Rick Clark? The no. R&B, uh, 90s R&B singer from England. No. It was an acapella of Rick Clark. And what I had done, uh, how I did the remix as such, basically I played it on my cassette and I had my keyboard with headphones. So I'm listening to my keyboard and the a cappella playing off there onto speakers there. So as that starts, I'm triggering it and then I'm playing along. And then when I went there, I said, I played in just the music. So yeah, this is the music for that a cappella because I haven't got the equipment to put it together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a no sequence. Uh, no, 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 no sequence. The, no, the only sequence it didn't was even rock up with f- down. Not even a floppy disk. <laughs> no, nothing. <laughs> It was a little cassette recording of my instrumental, but then he put me in a studio to put it together. Mm-hmm. And then it went from there. Um, so by it, this time, obviously, you're talking, you're talking about a, a ridiculous studio, right? That they're yeah, yeah, yeah. Jazzy, yeah. Jazzy had a studio with a, he had three rooms, a 48 track, um, massive, massive studio. And um, so he uh, signed me at, to his production company Basically, he was paying me monthly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Back then, I shouldn't say this, but I was young and um, having the council pay my rent as well as I was getting these checks. <laughs> so I was living it happened. life. <laughs> it, it happened. happened. <laughs> it happened. So, yeah, that was going on. And that was going on for about about five years. No. Yeah, five about five years before I started doing my own stuff while i was at soul to soul okay so you're you're engineering for soul to soul productions as well as laying down your music for your own stuff or no not yet what was what was the dynamics well when jazzy signed me to his production it was just to make me so i go to the studio every day and just create music 
I wasn't an engineer, like a mixing engineer or anything like that. I was, you know, creating music. And um, I always call those years like my university years as such, because I had all this stuff available to me, all this time, and I was being paid for it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And, so, and were you getting any mentorship from anyone there? Oh, absolutely. Everyone that was there, engineer-wise, people that came into the building, you know, there was, you know, different artists and jazzy as well, obviously. Jazzy, uh, and it was, it come to a certain stage where I think Jazzy kind of took me under his wing. He must have seen something and uh, encouraged it. Cause it was lots of times when he could have said, you know what? Enough's enough now. I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. Uh -huh. Cause sometimes I wouldn't turn up for like a week. <laughs> and I've really? been. Yeah, I wouldn't Why? Yeah. Why? Do you take it seriously enough or just? Not as much, but you know, like I'm a young guy and you know, I'm just mm -hmm. feeling lazy and, you know, waking up like 12 o'clock, one o'clock in the afternoon and all those things. You but you, you you would have been in a position that people would have given left, their left arm for, right? Actually, Jazzy had that conversation with me. He did have that conversation with me at one stage. It's like, listen, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, fix, okay, I'll, fix be, up. I'll be a fix up. Fix up. <laughs> I'll be a fix up. But he definitely uh, had that conversation with me one time. Did you feel the, um, did it give you a, a, a sense of, um, did you ever get a little cocky that you were in with such a esteemed company? Uh, and and so, you know, you pr you're probably a little aloof, maybe is a way of looking at it. Possibly, possibly. But like, by then, Soul to Soul was already a household name, but from five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. So the, it, it was more of a case of um the fact that i was being paid to do what i like doing do you remember than... so let me ask you as i'm listening here i gotta say hi to sahara uh Anne comes in and hey, says good evening to us both and uh pugs is is throwing down about uh funky dread records mm. um and michelle is asking were you in the music video of soul to soul yes i don't remember that I was in a music video for, there's a track, Soul to Soul, I think it was 95 or 96, but it was a track called, um, uh, uh, the, no, oh shit, Soul to Soul I Care. Mm -hmm. I think it's Soul to well, Soul I Care. Well, this is what I was about to, I was about to say. So thank you for giving me that information, Michelle. Maybe I should put a bit of research into these interviews. Um, <laughs> so around about 96, 97, you say about I Care. I remember that track. There was a Maserati mix, which was really, really Yeah, Tony Maserati. I remember when that was done. I was there when that was done. Really? Was yeah. yeah I, I, I love that. I love that. Maserati Jeep mix, I think it was called. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because uh, uh, that's around the time I was doing R&B and hip hop type of vibe at Soul to Soul. Mm -hmm. Because on that single, my my mix is on there but okay. it's not working obviously it might be cat or okay it's it's not no it actually might be cat four by four mix or that might be do you believe i'll, I'll have to check it out There's so a what I, started off, I, I have got that somewhere what i was going to ask do you recall because for me at that era soul to soul were big off of the back of um booker t remixes Booker T did a, a couple of really big remixes for them. He did Pleasure Dome, right? Mm -hmm. I'm one of the original writers of Pleasure Dome. Okay. It's Ple Pleasure Dome was um, 1998. Mm -hmm. That that album. So I this is when I'm because I'm I'm a production guy in there, and I think it was uh oh Jesus, I was going to say Jeannie Morrison, but it's not Jeannie Morrison. That Soul to Soul I Care. He wrote that. But Pleasure Dome is um, Jazzy. Um, oh my God, I can't remember the people, but I'm one of the people. The Pleasure okay. Dome, because I actually remember when Booker did the mix, and I remember when um, Tough Jam did a mix of some of the stuff. But I'm not part of that world at all. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm Soul to Soul producer guy, whatever. I haven't even started doing my own stuff, but I remember. I I, I could see it now. I could see. I could see Matt and Carl coming to the studio to play their mix of it. Aaron Booker was there. Booker knows me from being the little kid up in the attic above okay. the studio. 
ask you about that. <laughs> were you in were you in awe of them or were you not really aware of what they were doing on the scene? I wasn't aware of what they were doing as such. I just knew they were they were just producers who did music. So I'm putting a note to put a, a, a pin in the conversation there. We want I meant to say this from the off and we got sidetracked to making sure everything was working. On your official biog, and it's been said on a few times, uh, you are considered by many as one of the founding fathers of the UK garage movement. I know for a fact that you would never say that, right? Because Some even just, like from, just from talk, talking about this, you know, 97, 98, you don't know who That's way years are. after. Exactly. <laughs> That's you know. years later. So we like wanted, said, to, we wanted to put that straight, right? No. people. You know, people say, you can't control what people say. Oh, all I can say to that is when I came into it, it was a change in time. Okay, well, let's let's pause there because there's about 18 months before we get to that. Mm. So so, so we're working, you're working with, uh, in the studio, we've sold to sold. Jazzy's had his conversation with you. You've fixed up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, not DJing at all at this no, point, No, right? no, no, no. I didn't start DJing until 2006. Okay. Like I said, I don't have any records. I started, <laughs> record shops have disappeared when I started DJing. <laughs> Well, actually, no, it was about a year or so that I was buying records, but I was recording them off onto CD and playing off of CDs, CDJs. Nice. But yeah, I didn't start DJing until 2006, and that was only because I couldn't sell records anymore. Yeah. So that was oh, right. Well, again, we're, we're, get, we're losing the timeline. 97, yeah. 98, 99, something happened, something changed. You must have, and actually, maybe this is at some relevance. I was introduced to you uh, in Ayanapa, uh, by Frankie Funsit and Frankie Funsit, uh, I, I remember on the interview he said, "Yeah, there's this," and it, he actually called you. There's this <laughs> young cat on the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I remember that. We're on that's the just beat. come back. That's just come back to me now. Uh, there's a Colin. Yeah, I got some couple of cats. <laughs> yeah, couple, couple of young cats. <laughs> couple of young cats. Um, that was so, a talk back then. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was, so that would have been two thousand. So was was yeah, Frankie I met you responsible? Before that. But you know, I met you before that. Right, I can't, I can't remember. I met you when I first met you. I was with Jazzy, and Jazzy came up to Birmingham, and I came with him. That's when okay. I met you and Simon first. And you guys were, were you with that Choice FM? Were you both at yeah. Choice? Yeah, yeah, that's how I met you there. When we did the interview, I had known you or met you a good couple of years before that. Oh, a year you have, before that, you have to forgive my ignorance, mate. There's been a lot of um, Stella drank since <laughs> then, so. <laughs> You know, it all <laughs> fades into it the fades, yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so I'm I'm trying to get to the crooks of how something must have happened that magic moment that all of a sudden now you're you know you're you're gold dust. Well, okay, so I'm at Soul to Soul making music, but there's a point where I decide that I don't want to make R and B and hip hop style anymore, right? Because I come from England, there's not much artists who represent that music here. We had, uh, I think we had Kelly the Rock around the time. We had E17, you know, e I remember E17 wanted to do more R&B swing style music, but the label won't let them do that. Right. Cause they, you know, our, our radio over here is different. So there wasn't much avenues to do R&B and hip hop. And I wanted to create my own style of stuff. Remember I'm raving jungle. I'm raving drummer based jungle on my own, not on my own, but you know, out of studio life and, um, and all my other things I'm into. And then, um, so this point comes where I'm like, okay, I think I should try and create something authentic to me. Do you know what I mean? When I say authentic to me, I mean British. I really respected what jungle was doing because I thought that was unmistakably English. Uh -huh. I don't think another country could have come up with that sound. Do you know what I mean? I stand by that, and I believe it's come from East London as well. Some people won't agree with that, but with the Sharp and Dance and them guys and Lenny D. Ice, it's East London, <laughs> and I'm from East. But um, uh, yeah, so I wanted to do something that was British, and I could say that I wasn't copying anybody because effectively, we you do an R&B and hip hop, you're copying the Americans. Yeah, and uh, I, I actually remember going to a seminar some type of um, musical function with Jazzy and uh, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis. No, Jimmy Jam of Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis. All both of them were there. But um, it was Jimmy Jam talking and he said something that really resonated with me. He said something along the lines of how 
the creators here, the people that make music here, we shouldn't look at America as the way forward. Because he said, secretly, we're looking at you. You know what I mean? Do what you do. You don't look at us and think that we, we you got to follow this. And I, and it always stuck with me. And I'm sure I heard that before I decided to do my own things. You know what I mean? Okay. But, uh, and what it was, I formulated in my head was, I don't want to do jungle because I'm just jumping on the bandwagon with all my mates and all that they're doing that. So I thought I want to take what jungle drum and bass does and slow it down and speed up the R and B you know, the chords and, you know, the me melodic side of the R&B and hip hop and merge them together. And I come to the round of tempo of about 125, 126 around that tempo. But my tracks are more beatsy. They're, they're beats, break beats and stuff, but with chords and structure, you know, like a song. And, uh, and this is when I met Jazzy introduced because, uh, Lane, this is where Lane comes in the picture because Lane was a session singer on one of the um, the last albums in 97, 98. So this is where I meet Lane around that time. So Jazzy puts me with Lane. He talks to him, said, I've got this young guy. He's got some tracks. I think you two should, you know, hook up. So we did. And I had really been working on this m new sound as such by then. And uh, he put words to it. Okay. And, uh, but... I'm still no way while I'm doing it. This is under soul to soul. This is all under soul to soul. It wasn't until a school friend of mine by the name of Johnny J, he kept badgering me about going in the studio. So I picked a time when Jazzy B was away. He always went to Antigua in January for like a month or something like that. So John brought this acapella to me and it was uh, Whitney Houston. And this is 1998. It's not right. It's okay. The acapella. So um, we went in the studio and we did the track. We put our money together and put it out, put out white labels. And um, we- Alleg think, Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah, well, these, this is things that were done back then. <laughs> you know, you, you're trying to, you're trying to uh, make, a, not a name for yourself, but you're trying to get noticed, uh -huh. you know, and you haven't got access to vocals. And why else do record companies put the vocal, the acapella on the vinyl? Why? <laughs> yeah, of course. Like, you know what I mean? So um, we did that and we sold our first 500 copies and everything. And then we did, uh, then he brought um, Angel, which is Brandy, her track Angel. And then we did that and did the same thing. And then that got more note, um, got us more n notice. Um, but I then we was going under the name as X Men mm -hmm. by then. And that was me, me and my friend John. Mm -hmm. um, I was. Uh, um, I'm not trying to disrespect him or anything like that, but I was the one who's the programmer and the player and who puts all the bits in. And um, so, and, and, it, and it was that, what the reason why we, we split, because my dad and my brother was like, you've what, got what, all of this. dead weight? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, effectively, like, you know, you've got the pressing. That's what you, that's yeah. what your dad and brother that's would what say. You wouldn't say yeah, that about exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's what they were saying. And I was like, mm -hmm. so. And I said to I, I said to him that I was going to go basically because I was at so to so. So I'm already doing what I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know. So I just had to stop this little side project we was doing, and then I'm already now focused. Now there's a the, with these three, yeah. It, when I say three, it was a uh, Whitney Houston. It's not right. Brandy's Angel and Deborah Morgan. Yesterday. Okay. We did those three uh, white labels. And then we were going to have a label called X Factor. And I had these two tracks for it, okay. um, which was um, Down On Me and Scrappy. And it was going to be released on our label, but I had left him. So now I need to set up my own label. Mm -hmm. So then this is where I set up Manchu yeah. in 99. Because like my dad is saying, why do, you know what I mean? You, I can press this stuff for you. I can get master, you master here, blah, 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 blah. And we can distribute and... So I set up Manchu recordings and my first release was the track that I was going to put on our first release. It then went on my label and um, it all went crazy from there. So <clears throat> I'll come back to that. Oh, I lost the rubber off the end of my pencil. Uh, I, I don't know if this has any relevance in the timeline. Pogwash was saying, don't forget about production house. Is that part of that story at all? He's talking about the production house. The See now, 
Pug was just speaking again. This is the misconception of me that I like I'm a DJ. And I I I can see that production house label in my head, but I couldn't tell you a record that was on that label. Okay. I couldn't tell you the song, yeah, because I wasn't a DJ. I didn't but I know the name production house. Okay. Well, but you play me, I'll be like, oh, I know that tune. I know that okay. tune. But Let, let's move on from that DJ. then. So <clears throat> the five hundred the, the few 500 copies that you pressed up, do you remember, you must remember who were amongst your earliest supporters. That you oh, said, yeah, 100%. This, this, this person's like representing me all the way. Okay, the first one with Whitney Houston was Matt Jam Matt Jam and Carl Tuff of Brown. They had the track that we'd done, the first track I'd done, they had it in their charts for quite a while. They had a weekly chart and they had it in the chart for a long time. So that was them matt and uh carl supporting it and then when it came to um angel that's when more people like that's with spoonie spoonie would always say he's the first one but it was spoonie it was steps there was quite a lot of people but spoonie i will say that spoonie would finish twice as nice his last record for about i don't know how long was angel that was his signature last record and that was like my second record. And I'd be in there, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But yeah, he had a hand of really, a really driving that because he always finished his set with with Angel. And so, were you were you fully sold then? On the you were you, um, you know, balls I'm deep still beginning in, in, in in the garage? Stand, you know, did you have your champagne there at the end of the yeah, night? Yeah, and, and your, uh, your machino shirt. No, no, no. I never did that. I listen. One thing about me, I don't really do what everybody else does. I don't. I don't like to wear the the latest fashion. The latest. I don't do that. I never. I remember back in the day, everyone was wearing Prada and all. No, I wasn't doing that. I was trying to find labels that no one else was wearing, like Helmut Lang. You know, and I know they people know Helmut Lang now, but back then they wasn't wearing Helmut Lang. They were wearing Moschino Gucci. All to me, the bait names. Yeah, yeah. I try not to be. <laughs> I try not to consider myself to be bait. <laughs> I get yeah. Shout out to Snazzy Tracks. He comes in and says maximum respect. Uh, also, I did see Mr. Solomon passing through earlier, saying hi. Easy gas. Uh, respect oh, Gary, to yeah. the only way is garage. Uh, I must remember to give uh, another plug to the uh memorial party coming up oh, very jason. soon yeah. for jason um okay so yeah the the, the momentum is building yeah. you're so very um, fast sc scrappy and down on me were the was the the yeah. double a side yeah I, and i can i can picture the label man manchu and the, yeah uh, yeah know, that yeah. was the, it everything's happening really really fast really fast what are you what is your um, honest thoughts on your early production, um, the quality of the, the sound of your early productions, because for me, they got more polished as they went on. The earlier stuff was a bit, a bit more. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. Uh, and do you think that gave it a charm or do you think ah, could have been better? What the old, what gave it a charm being the older one, the older one, the older ones the having the more grit. The, the, oh, the, definitely. Yeah. Because I, I, because how they were done, really, back then you would have all your equipment and you got your song playing and then you would have to record it to that. Uh -huh. So, But I wasn't a mix engineer, so all I had was the faders up of how loud, it, how loud, it, how loud I wanted each sound to be. So there's no EQ, there's no compression, there's none of these things that I get bogged down with now. It's yeah. just straight levels, how, you know what I mean, a rough mix. And Down and Scrappy was exactly like that. I had a Yamaha 03 desk, 03D desk. I had no idea how to use that thing properly. <laughs> I had no idea. It had all these little settings it could do, compression, EQ, and I, I, I didn't know how to do any of that thing. All I was doing was creating, putting it in a sequencer, and then laying it out, and then that's my song. And then when it... Okay, so what you're talking about, the polished sound, is now when we start getting into the real records now. So now it's got to go from that stage to go into the main studio. So I had my little room doing that. Now, when it's got to get mixed, I've got to go into the room with all that stuff, set it all up, plug it all back in, call the song up, and then record each sound individually down to tape. Right? This is tape, not even, you know, this is tape. And then an engineer would mix it. 
he's cleaning it up the each individual signal each sound you know eq compression and some effects and puts it all together and then i'll go away for lunch or whatever and then come back and hear what he's doing and be like okay that's a little bit too well until he's ready to balance do you know what i mean then i'll be like oh, i want that that level that's too loud that affects too much bring that back you know what i mean this is mm-hmm. that's production you know what I mean? Yeah, How the, you the, the, archaic, the archaic nature of your earlier productions would have given it that charm amongst that, the you know, because you're talking about then, the the straight pop, as, I said, as, as I said in the description, the light, fluffy sounds of UK Garage, the sing along for the girls. Yeah. Then all of a sudden you're getting this grimy, darker sound. Not, not, necessarily, sound mo- not necessarily moody, but just the, the grit of the production gave it that, that charm, right? And that's because that's because of where i was trying to use the same approach as the jungle drummer bass boys i was using breaks i was chopping up break sounds and using the kick and the snare and open a hi-hat and all you know like you would in jungle that's how they used to do it doing all that so i was doing the same thing filtering you know bits of my loops so the grit is loops not drum machines you know what I mean? It's, it's loops and loops on top of loops and then uh, uh, SC1 bass. And, a, and a, lot of, a lot of happy accidents. Yeah, days. absolutely. Not knowing how to use this how you, and then <laughs> finding out, wow, oh, wow, wow. And then I'm playing that, I'm, you know, but I don't know how he's doing it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't really know how to control the level. I could do it now, but back then it's just, you know, accidents. And that was the beauty okay, of it. Let's not get too bogged down into into the tech because I'm yeah. sure there are many people who would love a, a two hour conversation about that. But we want to we want to talk about how then the momentum is going crazy at a fast pace. Um, yeah. Your head starts spinning a little bit. Then did you ever find feel a pressure uh, of like you gotta keep rising, keep doing better? Um, like I said, it happens so fast. But I do I remember it might even be the same year that we did that interview in Ayanapa. I remember having this moment um, by the stage playing and it was like four, three or four of my records in a row that was playing. And I was like, oh, that's me, you know? And it, it kind of, it kind of, it kind of sunk in a little bit and it, well, the magnitude of it all, I think I just signed to Soul to Soul did where well, we just signed a label deal and I signed to um Soul to Soul recordings. But yeah, it was um it was definitely that moment came in Iron Apple on the beach, listening to like three or four of my tracks playing in a row. And there could have been some alcohol involved as well. Yeah. So, you yeah know. And, a, and a few bikinis. Oh, always helps. Definitely bikinis, right? Always helps. And yeah, and, and again, <laughs> going back to that interview when you were saying, "Yeah, Lane's out there in the sea. <laughs> everyone, everyone thinks he's Wookie." <laughs> he used to say, "Everyone, he said, what guy? He said, "No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm Lane. I'm Lane. W- Wookie's the other guy." <laughs> then after a while, he said, "Look, forget it, man. I'm just telling." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, so I think we. I mean, it's we need to really get the um to hear from the from the beginning the the birth of battle and mm-hmm. the and the story of how it became the monster that it was so what are your earliest recollections okay the, how that happened so we're talking um i've done down on me and scrappy okay so i'm in that realm the harder kind of you know gritty as like you said earlier and then i'm making a new tune and it's the and my my drop is doom 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 doom. That's my tune, right? And I'm working this tune. And Lane comes in the room. Remember, we've been writing stuff together for a little while, yeah, for at least three years before two, yeah, three years before no, two years before this happened. So he comes in the room and he's like, "What's that? What's that? What's that?" I said, "Oh, this it, is this tune I'm doing." He goes, let, "Let let me write something to it." But in my head, I was doing another scrappy or another down on me. A very raw, you know, monotonous bass line that's, you know, just like the intro is the first drop. And um I wasn't sure <laughs> if he could write to it. So I said, yep, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to create a part for you to sing to it. 
And that's where the baseline changes. And when he starts singing, cause that's, I created that part from then on for Lane because mm -hmm. the tune in the beginning was another tune. It was going to be another instrumental raw club, you know, nasty track. And then Lane stopped me kind of <laughs> 16 bars in. <laughs> And then I start making a tune for him and then the bass line changes and then it all turns into chords and everything. But people like the dynamic of the two. Oh, incredible. So how, what, what came, um, where did the melody come from? Did you find the chord and then he wrote to the melody oh, yeah. of the chord? Yeah. Yeah. The music, I'd written the music part. Mm -hmm. And then when he said he wants to, yeah. So I've, I've, we're writing the, was he with me doing that? He must have been with me doing that, but I, it's based around the cause of the earlier part. It's just slight little um, changes. And um, it just kind of went from there. And he writes to what I've done, mm -hmm. musically. And then- Has, it, has he ever um, given um, a recollection of the inspiration for the lyrics? You know, was there anything that springs to mind where he, where he got the sentiments of the, of the lyrics from? Do you know what? That's a very good question because I've never asked him that. Really? No. I tell you what he has done. He actually did send me, and I posted it, I think, or he posted it, the original scribble of battle, the, the words on a on an A4 sheet that he's got. And um I had no idea how he how he came up with the the theme of it. Mm. I had no idea. Maybe um, it's, no it's, it's, it's such a, an uplifting song. I always think of Battle and then uh, slightly before Battle was uh, the Brass to Celebrate Life. Those mm. two records are such huge, high, uplifting moments in a sea mm. of darkness, mm. uh, you know. Okay, so mm. let, let's get let's get back to to Battle. So the bass line's down, you've, you've wrote the song for it. Where was that moment you either played it to somebody else or you gave it to someone and then you were like, whoa, hold on a minute. Shit's about yeah, to I get think real. Jazz, see now, Jazzy's involved now. Okay. We've, he's, he's, it's, it's now turning from me working from him, for him to me working with him. Yeah, we're turning into, or, or he's managing me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Doing, so we've done the tune you know what i really can't remember how the first who had it first who played it you know i really can't then that's really that's really weird i've got a blank in after doing the tune to it blowing up and how that happened right i really don't understand well, so that the, the battle blew up before the um before the album came out because yeah. it was like yeah. the main the main album on there what's the spanish one what's the back up, back up back up back up back up back up and that before or was that after no that's all after this is all that's, after. all, that's all after yeah because okay. so i've done danami and scrappy right and these and then these are released on my on my label manchu recordings so and i've done a, i'm doing a couple of remixes now this is where frankie fonset comes in through frankie fonset i did the gabriel sunshine remix okay for for ferdy at gobi mm -hmm. and uh i meet you just after that that's when he said i got this couple of cats coming through because i think i just done the uh, sunshine remix mm -hmm. and then um so everything's building and people are talking about me now and jazzy's getting wind of people talking about his his protege so now he's like starts to have conversations with people and now we are now looking at making an album. He says to me, you know, you got to make an album because, you know, it's he, or you, you know, and um, so everything I'm doing now is towards this. Well, actually, until I signed the contract, it wasn't really towards the album, but this, that contract came. So again, everything's really fast. Mm -hmm. Literally, I think from the time I'd done Battle came out July. The album was done. The album came out in November. But I'd say I'd done Battle maybe the November before. Okay. You know what so I mean? That was, so that was 1990 to 2000. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a, a DAT tape here, something or a picture of that tape that actually chronologically dates when I did each tune. 
Mm-hmm. And, and it was so I wasn't called back or... The interview that we did was the summer, and I wasn't. I was questioning myself. It was if it was two thousand or two thousand and one, but I did. I'm pretty sure. Or was it ninety nine that we did the interview? It that could be ninety nine. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not, I can't look up. Let me. You're talking about. You're talking about. In, you're talking about in, we in, in Iron Apple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, you may be, I think it's you really might have been there a few times. I interrupt. I interrupted you. Then uh, it wasn't going to be called battle. No, it was called um, it was called Southern Freeze. Really, I think was it? No, no, sorry, it wasn't called Southern Freeze. It was called Polish Freeze. What? <laughs> I don't know why it was called. Po- <laughs> Listen, when I make music and I make tracks, I name the track right, and it's kind of I think about what is the track make me think about, or you know, something that's been in my mind, and I call it that. It's just a, a working title, but it was called Polish Freeze. And I only realized six months ago, 23 years later, what that was actually called. Um, that was battle on the deck. Because for years on my deck said Polish Freeze. I'm like, what, like, what, what is, is it? Freeze? What is it? And it's well, the I'm... instrumental to battle. Okay. Well, I've, I've found it here. I'm just doing a quick search. It was, uh, I broadcast the interview recorded interview in july 2000 and that would have been the week after we did it in and uh so there's the can you right, see that okay. on the screen right there let me see no it's not gonna, to the angle no it's because of the um the cameras folks and oh, right, okay. anyway that interview is available you can find it if you google another time people andy ward wookie ayanapa you'll find that interview on mixcloud i got a uh, I got nominated for an award for that radio show, actually. I was very oh, really? proud of it. Yeah, I was very proud of it. Nothing Did to you do win? with you. You didn't win because you said nominated. No, you no, said no. I won. <laughs> no. I interviewed Booker, uh, Frankie. Um, oh, there was so many on there. So many on there. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So then he put up the album came out, self-titled, You in Your Sunglasses. Um, was the chart success with Battle? I can't remember. Yeah, I, I got to number 10. Okay. The single, Battle, yeah. I had number I had an, I had number nine for about two days, and then Louise Redknapp just picked me to number nine. She she pushed me back to ten, but I got to tell on, on her own, not in the group. No, not in the group on our own. Yeah, she had left Eternal mm-hmm. by then, and uh, yeah, she took my she took my number nine spot off me, and uh, but it's still a top ten. It's still, a top it was 10. a top ten, but what it what it did do, it was the. You remember when Tom the Pops when they used to do the fastest moving track that week or mm-hmm. something like that. So we actually, so I went up to Top of the Pops with the top 10, yeah, when it went to 10. And then about two weeks later, it started to move up the chart again. So we went back on Top of the Pops <laughs> to perform for that one time. I, mean, I did Top of the Pops with it twice. Behind the keyboard. Yeah, behind the was, keyboard. Was, standing it, was it saying, plugged in? Was it, was uh, it keyboard? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> with all the with all the kids standing around, <laughs> <when they're> yeah. <laughs> but come on, so, I grew up watching that. Now I'm on uh, it. <laughs> oh no, it's 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 got to be got to be pretty crazy. Yeah, uh, I I, I have a uh, I have a, a similar story that I shan't bore everybody with. I've told it a few times. <laughs> um, okay, so then the going out and about doing PAs, you must have been mm. PAing all over the country. I know we, we brought Lane. You know what? That's a sore subject because um, I didn't actually go to many of the PAs. It was just Lane that went. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a bit of, <laughs> it has a little bit of a, a bad mood because Lane used to complain and say, yeah, you send the gimp out. <laughs> so Lane would go and do all the PAs. I'm in a club party. <laughs> 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 because he's doing the vocals. So what am I going to do? I'm not what a are you going to do? I'm not a DJ, so I can't stand around the decks like everybody else is doing. So I'm like, you know, you might as well go and sing the tunes and then come back. <laughs> I hear that. Okay. So, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually do many. I did, did, we did like a couple of TV stuff or, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, a couple of t- like Wales and went to Wales to do a couple of TV. Uh, uh, okay. So rather than trying to break everything down chronologically, because so much would have gone on in such a short space of time, let's bring it back to the title of the video a man who changed the sound of uk garage you definitely did bring in a new sound and i do recall seeing a documentary where you had made a comment of you then started to hear other people 
not necessarily biting what you'd done, but elements of the sound mm. that you'd incorporated. And it was like, okay, so now that's gone that far. I need to step up again now. So just, just talk, talk me through that again. Well, the, the, I always took that as homage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know I mean, because I didn't come like when people say founding father and all that, I'm not a founding father. I wasn't part of the scene. You know, I was completely out of it. It wasn't until I jump in the scene, really, you could say 1999, where it comes, where it's leaving the sound of two step and going into the more UKG sound. So that's where people would say that my sound helped change that. But where I, I think I, I didn't do what other people did. My approach was very different. And I think that's what made um, people stand up to my sound and then say, that's different. And then, you know, they start doing a little bit of it. But where I noticed it most was when people kept saying, is that your remix? And I'd be like, no. And then I listened to it and I, Oh, okay. I guess you... <laughs> but a couple of times the people would say tracks and I'd be like, I don't know that tune. What tune is that? Then a little while later, I'd look it up and play it and I'd be like, oh. Yeah. I had one tune when it lit, I could actually name three of my tunes that they were trying to do. It was like the bass line of Scrappy. It was like the drums of this. And it was like this of that. You know what I mean? It was because it's a certain way I play my stabs, yeah. my organs. That jumpy kind of thing, and uh, I only really did that to make it more housey. <laughs> <laughs> that was in my head <laughs> to make my music sound a little bit more housey. Is where those type of stabs come from. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really funny, but um, in terms, I don't think I ever tried to um, think I need to uh, switch up what I was doing and um, reinvent myself or reinvent the sound. Because again, it was so fast. So 18 months, it was up and down. Do you know what I mean? Our, our, our label deal was going to some problems. So after the first, after battle, the second single came out, but it didn't really get support because we didn't, the, the infrastructure behind us wasn't, was breaking down really. Okay. So, um, what was the second single? Uh, get enough. Okay. Get enough. And I actually remember at the time, some certain people didn't play it because it wasn't garagey enough, if you know what I mean. But I was trying to, well, when I made the album, I was trying to be me, just do what I had always been doing. But because I'm now um, associated with garage, they expect what I'm doing to be garage. Do you know what I mean? Because if you listen to the track, Get Enough, I think Get Enough starts the album. It's the first track. And the inspiration for Get Enough is I was trying to do my type of... I wanted to do a version or have the same um, appeal as Off The Wall had. Okay. And when I get up and don't stop, don't stop Uh to get up. Well, actually, it's called Get Enough. Get up and don't you stop when your feet... Mm. You know, I was trying trying to make music here. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to box myself in and say, oh, it's got to be like this and that and blah, blah, blah. But people at the time wanted that boxy sound. You know what yeah. I mean? So they didn't actually support Gay Enough, which uh, I was quite disappointed with. I won't name names, but I, I know who you are. You know who you are. And I, did yeah. hear that, I did hear who wasn't playing it. Mm-hmm. The, underground, the Underground is not playing it. So, And when the Underground for, this is how fickle it was with the record company stuff. If the Underground ain't playing it, that, oh, if the underground not playing it, then we're not going to play it. Not that it's a good radio record. That's, you know, it's an authentic record. Why has it got to be, if they're not playing it, that you won't play it? So is it a rubbish record? Mm. So oh, along the, the, only other, the only other artists back then who were really getting that kind of um, energy f- from the record labels moving into the majors were sort of like art for dodger things like mm-hmm, that because mm-hmm. mj mj cole's debut album was also very varied yeah. with his musical styles and he didn't yeah. really get the commercial uh, success and the acclaim that he wanted he had well he had maybe three records on that album that was playing the clubs mm-hmm. maybe two, two or three two or three on that first album and um 
but you know we we just create music we just want to create we just want to create music we don't really want to be oh it's got we've got to do this or we've got to do that you know when we when we made the music in the first place we didn't think that so why do we start have to start thinking that and did did there, did there any any point you start thinking oh okay so when you aren't getting the support for the um the the more underground records did it frustrate you and did you think oh, oh i'm losing my relevance now and then you or did that never became part of the dialogue did, in your head not really no it was um i mean I, I remember when we did the we did have the clubs are getting a lot darker as well now and the yeah. ucs are getting involved yeah, and exactly exactly so they're playing less vocals in the clubs Mm-hmm. and less of that vibe like getting up is a kind of a, a happy where was vibe. where was little man in all of this little man was no little man's in 2001 okay. i think that remix in 2001 mm-hmm. um right i'll tell you a funny thing you know the the, the signature sound that ding 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 i only put that in probably that was probably the last thing i put in the tune and i only put that in because carnival was coming Okay. That's the only, you know, <laughs> because I thought still pans, clink, 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 clink. I said, yeah, this will go down Carnival. I think I've done it like June, July, and Carnival's coming in August. Do you know what I mean? So I'm thinking of then, and it turns out to be the main identifying thing about that song. And it's only put in <laughs> because of Carnival. This mm-hmm. I didn't really go to all the time. So that, that gave you another, uh, yeah. another boost? Yeah. That, that in the darker club edge mm-hmm. definitely 2001 yeah yeah 2001 so what was what was day to day like for you then um making music you know you're uh, my day- having a have trying to make a living now then what what was a nine to five like for you so my nine to five basic well it wasn't even nine to five it would be more like or six six till four was, in the morning you know, it was more like it, when i got to the studio so I was still at Soul Soul Studios then, so I get to the studio midday, one o'clock maybe. I go have I go to the gym, <laughs> then have my lunch after that, and uh, I'm just chilling out till about four o'clock ish, four or five o'clock, and then you know slowly mosey on. And then I, I always had this thing: is when this you know when when the outside world is closing their business. Is where my business opens up. Okay. You know what I mean? When the sun's going down, then I'm coming up. Do you know what I mean? Like, okay, time to work. I've you know, I've I've relaxed into it for the last three, four hours. Now let's make some beats. Mm-hmm. And I whenever you came that. to the studio, <laughs> you knew I was next door because it would be loud. Would be loud. Let, me, let me ask, because in all of this, I, I haven't asked a very important question that um probably needs clarifying. Wookie. Is it because of the surname? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, get, so, yeah. um, so Jason Chu, the surname Chewy. Chewy. And, that's my uh, nickname in in school. Chewy, Chewbacca, Chewy Mints, Chewins. Wow. The dinosaur. Like. Remember yeah, the dinosaur? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, I love that advert. <laughs> what, was it, it was a dinosaur, wasn't it? A T Rex or something? Chewy. Yeah. I'm feeling I'm it. Chewits. Yeah, it was a dinosaur on the well, top of the Empire State class. Building. I had a guy in my class whose surname was Chewitz, but T U I double T. Okay. But it's pronounced Chewitz. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so, yeah so, so it is basically. Um, yeah. But I'm not yeah. a Star Wars freak. You know, oh, I don't God. think I've seen past it. a fully, a full film past Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> Literally. Okay. I've just, those, those, that's Star Wars to me. After it's like, yeah. Yeah, whatever. You know what okay. I mean? You, let's stop that because you're going to alienate some people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So then, see ya. And again, not trying to do your full discography, but so the energy is building, building. At some point, the wheels start to fall off. Tell me about that that moment in time where things start to slow down. This is like I said. This was the um, the infrastructure behind us. The, mm-hmm. We we had a distribution deal with the, uh, a company called Piaz, which was the largest. Uh, independent distribution distributor in the country, which meant we were still independent. You know, we wasn't signed to a major, so you know we got a top ten record with playing in the in in a major pond. But uh, yeah, so that that business started to fall apart, and then it just kind of 
it's just kind of slid away at the same time. But yeah, when the business slid away, I actually started to work on a different project. I actually, I'm just coming back to me now. I started to do a um, a R and B ish. It's like I always went back to who I was or how I started, and it was again. It was merging what I had done before, this garagey up tempo stuff, slowing it down a little bit and coming to with R and B coming to a slightly faster, but not as slow as you know um, the R and B or stuff that was out at the time. And um, I did. I was going to go under the name of X Men, which was my alias E X E M E N. And um, it was supposed to be me and a load of singers and different people. I had like Lane, Lane wrote songs, some of the songs for some of the artists. I had a young guy called El Ray, who actually was a studio engineer, but he could sing. He done um he sung a track of mine called Runaway. Because Runaway originally is an R and B track, which I then remixed into Garage. And I had uh, Tyo Cruz, you know, Tyo Cruz, mm -hmm. who um, blew up probably about two years, a year or so, a year or two after um, we finished our stuff. Um, and I had Dynamite MC from, you know, Roddy Size's MC. He featured on a couple of stuff. And I was just trying to do a, a, a different project. But at the time, I didn't know that the business was falling apart. So this was going to be another project for me. And uh, I spent like three years doing this project and then come out the, at the end of it, like, oh, where's everyone gone? <laughs> kind of vibe. Do you know what I mean? And I'm sitting there and go, is someone going to say to me, what happened? <laughs> Turn the light off on your way. Yeah, do you know what I mean? And I'm like, oh, okay, let me just get my coat. <laughs> it literally was kind of like that. Wow. So, um, so is this 2002? Five. Oh, okay. 2005, so, yeah. Okay, so as I said, I was working sense. on this project. For three years. Two, two yeah. and a half to three years. <laughs> and um, I left uh, Soul to Soul 2005. Mm -hmm. And then um, basically went, didn't have a studio, didn't have equipment. Uh, I think I had a keyboard or something and my computer, but I don't, didn't really have uh, um, a setup. Because so is, I, is this when you had to go and get a, a proper job? Um, no, that was years a little, uh, quite a bit later. Okay, I met, okay. I met, I met, I met a woman not too long after that, and we had a relationship. We got married, and then you kind of had to do, you know, as a one of the hardest things being self-employed or being in this uh, entertainment industry is bringing in regular money. Mm -hmm. And when you have a partner, you can't be telling her, "Oh, wait, babes, I got no money this week," you know. I can't read out what this guy. So um, I started to do networks. I got into, and I wanted to find a job because I hadn't had a nine to five job for, that was 2000 and I got the job in 2008. So my last job before that, nine to five was 91. Wow. So before we jump into the networks, what were you doing in the three years then to 2005 to 2008? How were you surviving? What were you doing? Remixes here and there, a little bit of, um, um, yeah, mainly remixes. Um, was you uh, all through um, this? You were you were in a good place mentally. You didn't get no, down about it. Or... No, 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 no. I wasn't in a good place really because everything, everything had come crashing down. Mm -hmm. You know, it can, and it wasn't necessarily through a fault of mine, but you know, it came crashing down. And I had, um, <laughs> I had. Um, had a heartbreak at the same time. So I had a heartbreak happen. And then that made me say, you know what, F it, I'm leaving. And then I left soul to soul. So at that stage, you could almost honestly say, I could honestly say it's almost like I had two divorces at one time. Right. But I spent 10 years at soul to soul, broken up with this girl I was in love with. And I'm now at home and I'm like, <laughs> You know, crying. I, I actually remember writing, writing, right. Someone telling me about writing down my feelings or something like that, or how I felt. You know, like sometimes they encourage you to do that, too, so you can read it back mm -hmm. about that. But yeah, it was an um, it was a hard time, a good uh, hard time, because mm -hmm. I moved. I moved out of my flat. I told my brother that I was. I was living with my brother this whole period, 
And I told my brother, I'm going to move to Amsterdam. Because I knew some guys from over there and I was going to go to Amsterdam. A lot of people thought I went to Amsterdam. They thought I, I moved there and lived there because I actually was going to do that. But it didn't happen because my friend I was going to go live with, he had an accident in, he was a DJ as well, called Party Squad. And he had an accident in Ibiza. And he was in a coma for like six, seven weeks. So my plan to move to Amsterdam crashed. Wow. They had gone. So I ended up staying here. I uh, moved in with a friend of mine because I told my brother, I was leaving my brother. I told him that I'm going to move to Amsterdam. So he bought a flat and that's all going through. And then my thing falls through. I'm like, oh shit, I've got nowhere to live. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I ended up moving with my mate and I was there for uh, 18 months. And it was there. Yeah, that's when I got with uh, the woman I married. And, um, you know, just built up back again from there. And it just kind of, you know, just to where I am now, really. Mm -hmm. So Pogwash mentions about Live On. Live On, for me, I mean, my recollection, was big off the back of the Mark Grant remix. Is that is that right? Is that fair to say? Uh, I, the funny thing, I had the conversation today with um, with somebody that was just, just found out that that was my song. And they've been looking for that song for three years. And they thought it was called... So uh, so, you know, because he said so live on. He thought it was so 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 so. So he's been looking for this tune called so. Uh, anyway, um, I thought he might have been talking about the Mark Grant mix because I know a lot of people play that mix. And mm -hmm. the difference between the Mark Grant mix and my original mix is that Mark, for me, Mark put a more conventional house beat on it. And my beats aren't really conventional. If 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 it's in a house a bit, it's not like a straight, you know, uh -huh. uh, uh, A B C D. You're not saying exactly. it is, it, it, but it, it, was, it was like a huge soul heaven anthem for us. So yeah. that was where I was. I was yeah. aware of it, and so <clears throat> okay. And uh, that's sorry, just to say that record is. A, if you listen to the lyrics, it's a direct indication of how Lane and I felt at that stage mm -hmm. in two fact because that record was done in it was done in it was done between 2005 and 2006 it was probably 2006 but that's this is post soul to soul this is depression kind of stage and we actually and and the, I, i'd done the music and i kept hearing in my head so live on, live on, live on, live on. i kept hearing that in my head so when lane came i told him I played in the track and I'm going, live on, live on. So I gave him the chorus. I didn't know what it was going to be, be about. Well, actually, no, we discussed. We always had a discussion of what the topic should be. And I think we used ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, if it, it what's the first line? It, when your dreams has have been torn or something like that. And it really was about picking yourself up after you've been disappointed with something. Just to keep going, live on. And um, so when you asked me if I was, you know, depressed or whatever, yeah, Live On is a straight indication of that record, of that That's part. A, a straight reflection of it. Straight reflection. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we, we've, we've still got quite a few years to sit through. So the divorce, tell me, give me some, I mean, we got we got as long as necessary, but tell me what you believe is uh, a, another important moment where things change. Uh, and you can say, actually, you know what, this isn't, this is an important part because I started to take something more seriously. I started going to a different club. Uh, at some point you would have come and joined us in Spain, you know, all, well, all that kind of thing. It's funny thing you say that because it's there. It's 2011. 2011 is, a, is, is, I got divorced in 2010. I came to Vocal Booth in 2011, the summer of 2011. It's there that everything started. Remember me and you talking and you said, and I said some things and you said, Oh, blah, blah, blah. I'm happy. There were some things moving back in England. No, actually that was a year later. The first year I came, but 2011 is where it's the beginning of the resurgence. You could say, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Of me going back into doing music full time because I left the, I, I did the networks thing for four years between, even though I was doing, I still have my studio in my house. Uh, I was, you know, making beats now, every now and again, little bits of work. But um, I stopped doing that in 2012 and went back into doing music again, fully. So that was so, so a full-time job to um, something had to 
uh, satisfy your need for fine footwear? That's always been a thing, right? No, that hasn't always been a thing. You know how that happened? <laughs> the, foot, the, the, the footwear thing happened where obviously we get, um, you know, I'm, I'm 51 in July. Okay. Now, um, I'm playing in the club. I'm DJing and I finished playing. I'm standing by the edge of the, uh, uh, of the decks and I'm looking at the crowd. Now, okay, I think sorry, quite let, young people. Let's, let's come back to this. How, what was the decision for you to start DJing then? Because we've missed that. Oh, really. yeah, because, yeah, so we missed out me starting DJing. So I started DJing in 2006. But this is where, when I, yeah, live on, stop the music, I actually was going more uh, soulful house. Okay. Yeah. I remember watching, I remember watching it at Jazzy's house. I watched this documentary called um, Maestro. Have you seen that documentary, my yeah, for, uh, about New York? Yeah, on the house yeah, yeah, we've been yeah. seen, and you know, mm -hmm. I watched that, and I was like, "Did oh, you go to? Did you come to the premiere with us? We we did the premiere for Soul Heaven, and then we did we did the pre. No, I didn't. No, yeah, and then we we did the Soul party. We did the after party at Ministry. No, no, I didn't. No, I didn't come. I saw the I saw the the, the film at Jazzy's, and I I always remember. Uh, I think it is um, Frankie Knuckles who said this. He said, um, "You can have, you can have your jungle, your techno, your blah blah." And he listened to all this music, but it all comes back to house. Mm -hmm. It all comes back to the disco. It all comes back there to house music. And I was like, "No, oh, he's got a point," you know. And that's when I decided to start doing focusing on house tempo 126 125 126 tempo and that's where I live on and all those tunes and that's when i started dj and i started dj because i wasn't selling records anymore record shops were disappearing and uh, distributors were disappearing you know where we our first we would press records and then you know press 500 then a thousand or whatever and then it was going down to like 300 and it was unsustainable it wasn't worth doing it anymore so I wasn't getting an income from my vinyl anymore. So I had to find a new way of um, earning money. What next best thing to do, but become a DJ like everyone else does. But I was very proud of the fact that I wasn't a DJ back early 2000s, but I had to join everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. And did you, did you uh, pick it up quite easily? Were you quite good? Um, Cause there was no, sync, there was no sync button. Back no, then. no, no, there was no sync button. It was on CDs, CD, yeah, CDs. I remember, um, I'm playing house music, buying, you know, defected stuff. I'm on track source, getting all my sound, getting my stuff together, trying to figure out what my sound is of it. Cause I'm thinking, well, I'm a, I like melodic stuff. I like heavy stuff. I like deep stuff. So when I play, it's a reflection of kind of my personality or such. So I look for that in the tunes I play. I, don't, I, I never play something because it's big. You know what I mean? It's a massive record. If I don't like it, I'm not playing it. Do you know what I mean? And to be honest, that's how I felt about Hey Hey. I think I said this to you before. Hey Hey was a massive record, but it just didn't fit my style when I'm DJing how I wanted to feel. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, then, and, and I remember going back to it about, about that two months later thinking, make, make, give me a chance again. I'm playing it, playing it. I'm like, no, I don't have to play that. Everyone plays it, so I don't have to play it. I don't, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. So I started DJing and then picked it up pretty early. Bought some CDJs. I used to practice. I played with some friends of mine in a, um, bars um, doing like four-hour sets. You know, them long hours. Yeah, doing a of rock. Actually, you know what I mean? Pogwash is reminding me here. There were a few technical issues in the early days. I do really? remember. Really? <laughs> oh, with me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh no, he's talking. Oh, he's talking about. Uh, he's talking about vocal booth. Uh, yeah, about, yeah, 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 that's when I was using Serato. That's it. When I used Serato, and yeah, I remember that. And no one knew how to take it off of through. Yeah, and I was abs I was absolutely. It, this was this was a very very rare occasion. I was absolutely blind drunk on the. Oh yeah, that one time. Yeah, yeah, I can't, that one time. can't get his tunes sorted. And, <laughs> and I had to use. I had to use between your Matt and, Matt and the one CD, <laughs> and I kept turn. I remember playing the tune. I turn around. Um, have you got? Have you got this tune? Have you got my? Have, have you? <laughs> I just yeah. get the tunes because I, I bring bring him to Spain. 
pay him twenty thousand pounds and he's playing my own records. <laughs> we had a good time, though, didn't we? We had some good times, mate. We Fantastic really times. Time. Okay, so let's spend thirty seconds talking about your shoe fetish. Oh yeah. So basically, I was um, in a club and I'm looking at the audience that I play to, which is really they were in the early twenties. Yeah, and I remember looking at them, looking at me, and looking at them, thinking I look like them, and. I didn't think it was cool that I looked like them. You know what I mean? I'm like old enough to be their dad. So I'm like, I need to dress appropriately. And um, Instagram and watching some, seeing some, you know, pictures and then it's kind of triggered. Oh, I like that. And then it just kind of got to me wanting to buy shoes. And I'm a person, when I like something, I'm going to keep doing it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I want, if it's in that color, I, I want it in that color as well. I don't want this variation. I need all options. Mm-hmm. If I'm going here, there, or there, I need the options. So it just grew and grew and grew to the point. And then I started to look for um, bargains. People, because a lot of times people buy the shoes and they buy the wrong side and they need to sell it. So, you know, I found, um, you know, uh, unworn, boxed, cheaper on eBay. Then it became, <clears throat> yeah. you know, looking, because these shoes okay. are like 500 pounds. I'm like, What's that? What's that, that, what's that movie? I was thinking of you. I'm sure you'll know when they say we wear Oxfords, not brogues. What's that? Movie? There's, there's a movie. It's a, it's a strap line anyway. Because I always remember saying about the brogues, and you were like, they're not brogues. They're yeah, not they're brogues. derbies. That, that's the, that's it. You said we wear Oxfords, but brogue, but these got that wrong because brogue is only a pattern. It's a, it's the it's the brogue in on the shoes, but Oxfords and derbies are two different shoes. You wear an Oxford when you're in a suit, and the derby is more casual. Okay. Most shoes are most shoes are derbies, but the dress shoes are Oxfords. Okay, Something I learned like that. that. I, th- I think it might have been on that film, The Gentleman, or not The Gentleman. Anyway, it's one of the. I think I've seen it. I, I it's irrelevant. It it's irrelevant. I, I um, so we're carrying on with the timeline. Then, uh, at, uh, so things went well. You, you, you know, you you uh continue to have some fun then do you, the majors start knocking on your door again looking for some more remixes because yeah, you did have some this is 2012 some... 2013 now this is yeah so i remember one year i was leaving vocal booth and i got the email about doing the um jesse j remix that's it thank you jimmy and, um, king the kingsman was the film the kingsman oh yeah, yeah i've, I've seen it. that yeah, yeah um uh yeah jesse j remix um who you are mm-hmm. i did that and um and then quite a few different remixes but i kind of walked myself into a corner back then as well because i kind of realized that i've done too many remixes and you know there's no um back end in remixes you get paid a fee and then that's it and now i've got remixes that i played for 20 years i'm not making any money out of a record that's been played for 20 years so i'm like I'm gonna stop doing these remixes. It's not worth doing it. You know, I'm I'm giving away art here for exactly, next to nothing, yeah. and people are living off this, and I'm not getting anything for it. So, um, I decided to stop doing that, stop doing the remixes, and then just concentrate back on making my own tracks. You know, and then building up my catalog like I have now, and um, it's a good time right now. Uh huh. Definitely things, are, things are going well well we'll we'll get to some news that you're going to share um we want i i made a joke about uh you uh being heavily influenced after meeting me and becoming a full-time brummie but you are a full-time brummie now and you've got you got a great network of people around you so yes, tell, tell us tell us about tell us about life for you at the moment after a, a really tough few years what, COVID. with covid yeah and then and with you losing your brother as well so right. talk us about because that must have been a, a dark it was all a, it, yeah it was all at the same time so i had been thinking about moving out of london for a while because london has just become ridiculously expensive now i would um so being a dj producer i could live and work from anywhere you know so i was trying to figure out where's the best place for me to go and i wanted to go somewhere where I knew the most people and I would like just climatize quite quickly. Cause say like, if I, I, I'm from London and then I go live in Oxford. I might know one person in Oxford 
that one person now is now my best friend and my, you know what I mean? He's everything. And I didn't want that to happen. And I didn't see a point of moving to Oxford and having to drive back into London or whatever to go to the major airports around London. And Birmingham was a, a good choice because it's in the Midlands. It's in the middle of everywhere. I don't just play in London. I play everywhere, all the cities in, in England. And um, being in the Midlands is perfect. I'm right in the middle. I drive everywhere. And um, it's... Uh, it, I moved here right in the middle of COVID in 2020, July 2020, I moved up here. And um, September 2020, my brother was diagnosed with um, stomach cancer and then he died in December. So that was incredibly fast. Um, I remember actually when I was thinking about moving up here, and I found out that he was sick, that I thought, am I not going to be able to move up here? In terms of, it, I didn't think he was that bad. I thought it was something, you know, that it, it could be um, treated. But it turned out that he was untreatable and um, he he died quite quickly. Um, and then, but life up here, there's been, you know, I've got good, like you said, I've got good people around me. I've got... Um, uh, I don't know how to what even to say with him really. You know, he's just uh, he's 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 always here. He's right here actually. I have his um his card here. Let me see that. I have that in the studio in, with his moody look. Because he used to look at me like that all the time. Anyone knows my brother knew that he smiled, but then he he would give. It was a, a not a full smile, but you had to work hard to get that smile. Because he mostly gave you that kind of. So, so remind me how how many years there are between him and then your sister. Okay, so, so I'm born in 1972. My sister was 74, and my brother was 75. I so we're so. we're actually there's 18 months between me and my sister, and it's 18 months between my sister and my brother. Mm -hmm. So and then uh, I have um, about five other siblings outside. My dad's a um, a bad boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The shiny. There's, there's a wicked meme, and it says, "If your dad wore these shoes, then you've got a lot of brothers and sisters you don't know about." That's me. You got a lot of siblings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So but I've got some younger siblings that are outside of the family. I I had said before we started talking that I did want to at least definitely give Leon a mention, and I didn't want it to catch you unawares because having been through the same uh, mm. loss myself. Mm. I know what it's like, but uh, you went through a dark place. We communicated a fair bit, um, but uh, you seem to have handled it. Um, is it a, a, a like a, a front that you put on? Uh, it, do you not handle it as well as, as you, you may care? Um, I think I'm, uh, people don't really know me. No, I'm quite, uh, I'm a lot, I'm quite in my head. Mm -hmm. So I've, you know, I, I think about him loads of times, and but I don't let it consume me, if you know what I mean. I have a, a weird way of looking at things, and you know, I, sometimes I, what happens to me the most, I can't, I take a glimpse of the picture and I'm like, wow, yeah. you're not here. And it's that confusion, like, what the, what, what, how? You know what I mean? You have to, that's the question you ask yourself. And then, you know, you, you, you let it go because you accept that it's going to happen yeah. to us all. No one knows when we're all going to go, but we're all going to go. Yeah. And the thing is that it must be comforting for you knowing how well revered he was. Yeah, absolutely. So many people. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. When when he died and just all the, the, the uh, posts and stuff about it, it was very uh, humbling. And how my brother, he was, he had a, he had a hand in a lot of people's lives. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in this music business, a lot of these, like these young grime guys now, you know, growing up, you know, um, I hear stories from them all the time, how he would say, uh, you know, let let the young kid jump the queue. To, he would look after people because if you don't, if you're not in music house, it's a dog eat dog. If you sit there and wait and you're meek, someone's going to come in and just take your place because you haven't said nothing. So he would look after them people. He would see them sitting there for ages. Yeah, no, you're not next. He's next. And he would say that to people like, you know, 
Goldie or Groove Rider, whatever, because I remember back in the day, Groove Rider, he's the mess about coming to see you. I'm next year. And he just walked in and there's about seven people waiting. <laughs> I'm next year. <laughs> so, so it's it's kind of, it's like the, the barbershop of the music world. Yeah, exactly that. The community <laughs> centre of the of, of the music business everything all the cussing was going on outside the loads of stuff well, well, great. well listen it, it was it was it was great to um you know to, to bring up and, and put a smile on your face when mm. when mentioning him we have been chatting for an hour and 40 minutes and mm -hmm. i say all the time there's so many so many twists and turns that we won't have covered but um things are still going great for you and yep. you've got some brilliant news that we can reveal that's yes, happened well, exclusively I, I... today well, do you know what? I completely didn't realise that this interview was live. I thought it was just me and you talking, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's like that. But um, yes, I've um, today completed a um, a sign in. Um, I'm signed to um, a label called Darko Recordings, which okay. is uh, and, and cool. tell us the significance of that for anyone that doesn't know. Oh, uh, basically, uh, oh, of Darko of the yeah. Oh, Dark, okay. Label. Darko Recordings is run by Darko Spees. He used to be vice president at um, Island. I think mm -hmm. he signed Amy Winehouse and uh, Mumford and Sons. So I've known him for years, but he has his own imprint with Warner. And um, I've just signed an EP deal with him. So I'm excited about that. I've got a single coming in six weeks. Six weeks of uh, something that I had done before. And um, but it didn't come out. So what I've done, I've taken the um, the vocals of that off and done new vocals and some additional production. And that's going to be the first release. It's a cover of a record that I did before. I might say what it is. It's a cover of um, Ordinary People. Remember Ordinary okay. People? John Legend. John Legend track here. Yeah. Uh huh. There's a cover of that. And um, and then I'm going to be doing a couple of. Uh, well, I've got to get busy now. Because literally, I signed it last night and I've got the signed copy back today. Well, about half an hour before we came on. So it's all official now and uh, it's time to get to work. Beautiful. Well, you're getting a lot of praise inside the chat. School has been here for a while. He says, yes, so it happened. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we had given Schoolie a shout earlier as being the person who introduced you and I alongside Jazzy yeah. B. I'd completely forgotten all about that all mm -hmm. those years ago. That's right. 27... I love yeah, yeah. I would have come with Jazzy. Years. He would have been coming to see you regarding the soul to soul stuff. But it wasn't me. And I think he brought me along, you know, to maybe introduce, but you know, saying like this, he's next kind of thing. I'm pretty sure it's like 99. Yeah, it had to be 20, 99. 24, 24, 25. Yes. Mm -hmm. Long long time. Yeah. Right. Well, Paula is saying good for you. Good evening, Paula. I, I did see you earlier. Um Okay, so the energy continues still in this game. Twenty, you know, from way back then, from thirty the, years. I've been uh, it's thirty years. I've been making yeah you know, longer than I'm fifty one years. Thirty years. Mm -hmm. And you and you you still don't look a day over twenty four. There's a little couple of grays coming through. There's a couple. <laughs> Just a couple. Oh, well, and I'm holding on to the top of my hair as well. I'm growing this because everyone my age loses their hair, so I'm showing off right now. <laughs> so when my friends see me, they get jealous. <laughs> that smile. That smile. <laughs> right. Okay. I think we've we've covered uh, a, a fair bit, haven't we? Yeah, we could have um, talked. We could talk for ages, but we, we, we could talk. Random. We could talk for ages. What I will say is, if anyone has the pleasure of bumping into Wookiee when they're out and about, please go and tap him on the shoulder and have a chat with him. He's one of the nicest guys you'd ever wish to meet. Um, and uh, somebody had said earlier, can we get Wookiee back for a garage set at Vocal Booth? Well, we'll definitely make that happen. But yeah, we can uh, do that. Are, are you playing for um, Jason's do at uh, The Only Way No, garage? I'm not. I'm, so, I'm, I'm supposed to be somewhere else, but I, I wanna, I'm trying to get back in time to come to that. Mm -hmm. actually but no i won't be i'm not playing there okay well hopefully I'll i might see be you there. at the end of oh, you're july gonna... yes no, no end of july yes because that's two days after my birthday so i will definitely be there okay my birthday is the 27th you're 29th maybe we should get you to come and play on the terrace i'll talk to you about that maybe mm. that, could, that, that could work if i can afford you I'm doing autumn i'm doing autumn in october uh, july august you mean, you mean... 
All right. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Andy. Yeah, yeah. I'll talk to Mr. M. Yeah. Okay, yeah. dude. Listen, we shan't keep people here too long, mate. I've really Thank enjoyed you. just taking a trip Thank down you, memory man. lane. I, I hope we've done your wonderful career justice. No, always, always. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate and, the, the, the interview. Yeah. It, it, it was lovely, man. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. And, I'm, sorry, uh, I'm sweating look, my practice look, off here. Uh, so congratulations again on the signing. <laughs> Thank and, you. Uh, uh, you know, I just say goodbye to everyone now. Peace, man. See Respect. You nice one. Okay. And there goes Wookie. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. We could have really chatted all evening. That's genuinely the way, right? When you, you know someone and uh, you've got a good connection, you can... Uh, just chat and chat and chat but it's not fair to have you sit and listen to two old farts reminiscing about the good old days and there's still a lot more to come you can see on the screen i've now changed the date monday coming i'm going to be talking to justin wilkes we spoke about choice fm we spoke about galaxy um when wookie came up to birmingham justin wilkes was a big part of those choice and galaxy days then moved on to Kiss FM, amongst many, many other things. It is Thursday night, but I've got so many great conversations and so many great guests lined up that I'm going to squeeze in a couple of these uh, over the next few weeks. So I will um, bid you farewell. I've just looked at the time and I've realised I'm supposed to be on a book club somewhere else now and it's totally run over and I never realised. Guys, thank you all for your ears. If you have recently subscribed to the channel, then you will see your name here uh, on the right hand side. All of my access members who support me on a monthly basis. And if you want any graphics, any videos doing or any websites or hosting, then I'm your man. Thank you as always. One love.